before reading today's scripture, I'm going to uh, offer a brief overview of Jacob's story according to Genesis chapters 26 through 33. And I encourage you, as you have time in this coming week, to review Genesis chapters 26 through 33 to get a fullness of the story. If Jacob were alive today, he would probably be a Wall Street trader. Three-piece suit, chauffeur-driven limousine, a portfolio of blue-chip stocks, and a penthouse suite overlooking Central Park in Manhattan. He'd have it all because he was a shrewd competitor. He came out of the womb, the scripture tells us, with his hand grasping the heel of his twin brothers. Grappling he was to be first because the firstborn always received a greater portion of their father's inheritance. That's how he got his name, Jacob. It means heel grabber or supplanter or trickster. He and his brother Esau were pawns in a greater conflict between their parents, old Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. Isaac preferred Esau, the elder twin, who was a rugged, outdoorsy type, and Rebekah gravitated to the spry, shrewd Jacob. The intrigue in that household was the stuff of a paperback novel. Rebecca coached Jacob how to steal his father's blessing, which was intended for his elder brother Esau. When Esau discovered his brother's trick, he threatened to kill him. Fearing for his life, Jacob fled the promised land and went to a place called Haran, where he sought refuge with his mother's brother, Uncle Laban. On the way, at a place called Bethel, Jacob had a dream of a ladder which rose into the heavens, with the angels traveling back and forth from heaven to earth. He heard the voice of God say, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. When he awakened, Jacob built an altar and he prayed, if God will be with me. You notice the emphasis here? If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go and, I, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Notice Jacob was still striving. He's this time bargaining with God. You see how that works? Then he continued on to Haran, where he met his uncle Laban, who proved to be just as tricky as his mother, uh, as, as Jacob's mother, Rebekah. You see, Jacob fell in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel, and Laban agreed to give her to him in marriage if Jacob would work for seven years to win her hand. But then on the wedding night, Laban substituted Leah, his older and a bit homelier daughter, for the lovely Rachel. Isn't that ironic? Jacob, the trickster, fell for Laban's trick and married the wrong woman. But he was so smitten with Rachel, he agreed to work another seven years to win Rachel. I imagine this time, Jacob must have resolved himself never to be tricked again. During those 14 years under Laban's employ, Jacob's shrewd business dealings amassed great wealth, both for Laban and for himself. But despite his success, there was a hunger 
in Jacob's heart, a hunger neither wealth nor possessions could satisfy. For one thing, Jacob longed to go back home, back to the promised land where he had fled. So when God instructed him in a dream, return to the land of your ancestors and to your kindred, and I will be with you, Jacob now fled Haran, snuck away from Uncle Laban, taking all the livestock and household possessions. Well, Laban gave chase and caught up with Jacob, who managed to negotiate a covenant of mutual protection. Now Jacob could finally head home safely. Well, maybe not. After what he'd done to trick his elder brother out of the birthright and Isaac's blessing, Jacob feared I Esau might still be out to kill him. So what did Jacob do? He sent messengers on ahead of him with a series of generous gifts for his brother, hundreds of goats and sheep and camels and cows and donkeys. For he thought... I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterwards I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. We pick up Jacob's story now at verse 22 in Genesis chapter 32, and I'm going to read 10 verses here. The same night he got up and took his two wives his two maids and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. My brothers and sisters, this is the living word from our living God. Let us all say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, speak to us from your heart to our heart that we might know you better, that we might love you more, that we might serve you more effectively. For the sake of Christ and his work in the world, we pray. Amen. I want you to imagine Jacob's troubled spirit as he prepared to re-enter the promised land and see his twin brother after all these years. He lay down beside the stream, and Scripture tells us a man wrestled with him until daybreak. This morning, I want to explore this question, who or what was Jacob wrestling that night? Was it indigestion? Maybe too much wine? Or perhaps he was having an unfamiliar attack of conscience 
Maybe Jacob was wrestling with regret about his treatment of Esau. For decades, Jacob has been estranged from his twin brother, and he knows it was his fault. He had deceived his father and betrayed Esau to win the coveted birthright and blessing. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, Jacob was having a twinge of guilt, regretting his past mistakes? It is not unusual for people to wrestle with regrets of the past. I know I have. How about you? Benjamin Franklin neared his final days, and he commented that his life had been good, but if he could, he would, quote, run again from beginning to end the same career of life, except the next time I want the privilege of an author to correct the second edition certain errors of the first, unquote. Don't we all wish we could make some corrections in the second edition, rewrite the story of our lives, have a couple do-overs now and then? Well, we've all wrestled with regrets about what we've done and what we've left undone, haven't we? Perhaps Jacob was wrestling <clears throat> with the dark ghost of regret over his past. On the other hand, perhaps Jacob was wrestling with anxiety about the future. After all, his brother was heading right toward him with 400 men, and Jacob figured Esau must have murder on his mind. Isn't it true? <clears throat> our guilt over past misdeeds tend to compound our anxieties about the future, don't they? And if Esau didn't get him, well... <coughs> I'm wood. You see, Jacob was no spring chicken by now. Perhaps he was beginning to think about, I've got one, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I snuck it in there without anybody seeing me. Jacob perhaps was beginning to worry about his own mortality. Like comedian Woody Allen once said, I'm not afraid of dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. Was Jacob wrestling with his fear of death? Or was it something more significant, something deeper, something eternal? I believe in addition to all the other things Jacob wrestled with that night, ultimately he must have been coming to grips with his relationship to the living God. Remember, as he was leaving his homeland so long ago, Jacob prayed, I think, rather arrogantly, if you will be with me and give me the things I desire, I want a classy home, a fashionable car, a beautiful wife, bright and healthy children, then you can be my God. But now Jacob was older and wiser and a lot more humble. <laughs> And as he laid down beside the brook, knowing his brother's army was pressing in on him, he might finally get what was coming to him, what he truly deserved. And so Jacob prayed, O oh God, I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. I think something profound was happening to Jacob here, don't you? This was not just a prayer of desperation. I think it was also a prayer of recognition. Recognition of who God is. Recognition of who Jacob was in relation to God. Jacob had always been a competitor 
a striver. He knew what he wanted and he knew how to get it. He could turn any situation to his advantage. He could chart his own course. He could master his life. But Jacob, I think Jacob needed something more than the success he could achieve on his own. He needed a greater purpose. He needed to see that somehow his life was something bigger, something more lasting, something more important. Perhaps Jacob wrestled with the realization that his life was nearly over and everything he had strived for would soon be dust in the wind. What did it all mean? Did his life really matter? He wrestled all night with the man, and we wonder if it wasn't the man in the mirror. And that struggle was so demanding that Jacob's hip was thrown clean out of joint. This scene reminds me of another in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jacob's descendant, Jesus, sweat blood as he prayed, Abba, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It was that same kind of counter and counter for Jacob. And he was never again the same. For in that wrestling match, Jacob came to grips with the fact that God was the master of the universe and that he was not. You note, God could have destroyed Jacob in this struggle, and certainly God had every reason to do so. Jacob had lied and cheated his way to the top. He was a scoundrel who deserved to be ruined, but God, oh my gosh, this is good news for us, God did not treat Jacob the way he deserved. God showed mercy because God had a bigger plan for Jacob's life. Note, Jacob's assailant did not prevail with this wrestling match, and Jacob survived the battle. And I find myself wondering why. For me, this image helps. Think of a fine race horse, will you? It is not the trainer's desire to completely break or destroy the steed spirit, only to teach the horse who his master is so he can be saddled and ridden to win. Likewise, our struggles with God are not intended to utterly break our spirits to punish or to humiliate us. I think it's truer that God simply wants to teach us who our master is. God wants to bring us to humble obedience, so we are willing to give God the reins of our lives and let God accomplish God's purposes through us as God intends. Reverend King Duncan tells the story of a man who had spent most of his life in and out of bars, in and out of jail, in and out of relationships. One day he ran into one of his old drinking buddies who teased, hey John, you still spending a lot of time wrestling with the devil? Well, John smiled and answered, Nope, these days I spend most of my time wrestling with God. Incredulous, his friend said, Wrestling with God? How do you hope to win a wrestling match with God? And John replied, Oh, you misunderstood. In this wrestling match, I'm hoping to lose. Oh, my dear friends, 
How much time and energy do you and I waste in our wrestling matches with God? We wrestle for control of our lives. We wrestle for the right to call all the shots. We wrestle to chart our own course. We wrestle to fulfill our dreams and aspirations. And where does it get us, really? I don't know about you, but I'm learning that I'm more likely to get myself in trouble more apt to make my life and everyone else's life miserable. I am more prone to miss great opportunities to do something worthwhile and to be someone who is worthy of respect when I'm holding the reins in my life. In fact, when I'm trying to be in control, I'm most likely to limp away, weak, wounded when I insist on wrestling with God. So do you know what I've begun to pray these days? I pray, oh God, oh God, in this wrestling match for control of my life, please God, I want you to win. Let all of the people of God say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing together hymn number 354, I Surrender All. <laughs>
isn't it wonderful and a relief to know you don't have to be in charge of the world. Our Lord God has taken care of that. We just surrender ourselves to God's goodness and wisdom and mercy and grace and trust that as we surrender, God will use us in mighty ways as God used Jacob God can use you. My brothers and sisters, Jacob asked for a blessing, and let us offer this blessing to one another as our benediction. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you.